CEO of Trends Research and Advisory. I am delighted to welcome you all to the first Trends Education Conference, entitled Envisioning the Future of Education, Drivers of Change and Innovation, to be held over the next two days. My name is Sultan Arbi'i. I'm a researcher at Trends Research and Advisory, and it is my pleasure to serve as the presenter to today's conference. Please note there will be English translation for non-Arabic speakers via the provided headphones. With that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Mohamed Al-Ali, who will present his opening remarks in Arabic. Dr. Mohamed, please welcome. Peace be with you. I'd like to apologize for this uh, unexpected delay. Peace be with all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dear guests, it's an honor and a pleasure to welcome all of you to this highly important conference which is organized by Trends Research and Advisory under the title Envisioning the Future of Education, Drivers of Change and Innovation. This comes within the context of the Center's keenness on playing its role to discuss the different and diverse political issues that are of high importance to countries and nations and societies to highlight the latest developments and put forward the different views and concepts and draw about the strategies that can enable the decision makers to deal with these issues. Ladies and gentlemen, it is quite clear to all of you that education plays a central role in all countries which seek to achieve sustainability and achieve a leading position as education is the firm foundation that upon which prosperity and progress are established and the subsequent progress that comes when nations focus on developing its capabilities on the pillars of education. Given the central role played by education, the countries of the world spare no effort to develop education and to develop its education systems particularly given the massive developments that have been taking place in the world in recent decades, and the world continues to witness such uh, developments, particularly the elements associated with the accelerating uh, knowledge and information revolutions and the uh, artificial intelligence, different and diverse applications. No doubt that these transformations give us many opportunities to develop education and take it further towards uh, improving its different components, including curricula and pedagogy, and even uh, with the different uh, uh, facilities and establishments of education. And on the other hand, we have major challenges uh, in front of uh, governments and education institutions to continue to develop uh, the e education process and learning and teaching processes to empower new generations, not only to cope with this uh, knowledge and information revolution, but also deal with the uh, change in the marketplace and uh, the job market and also develop the capabilities that societies and nations need uh, to take a leading position in the era of the fourth industrial revolution and artificial intelligence. It is highly important here to highlight and showcase uh, the best international practice in the field of developing education and highlighting some successful expertise to benefit from them and to be able to know how the world thinks and how the world moves in terms of uh, developing education and promoting uh, the progress of education. This will be the main focus of uh, today's conference uh, for the first and second day. And it is highly important to get to know the opinions of the students who will witness the progress of this uh, education system as uh, they are the main focus of a forum of education. This uh, context, uh, uh, we can say that uh, Trends has had an outstanding experience in this domain before this conference as Trends Center conducted a number of uh, discussions uh, and debates uh, between uh, the different groups of uh, uh, students, whether school or university students, entrance uh, uh, headquarters about uh, the future of education. It has been a wonderful experience uh, and a very uh, rich one in terms of ideas and concepts. Ladies and gentlemen, Trends in Social Advisory fully understands the importance of education and the need for developing uh, education and education system given the continuous uh, uh, revolution and uh, information and knowledge uh, and to enrich uh, the global efforts of this world, uh, Trends decided to 
host this conference uh, to look into the main drivers of change and innovation in the field of education and to put forward the vision that would support sustainable development uh, in nations and societies. In this context, the conference will have uh, four key sessions uh, given two uh, sessions every, every day in the key days of the conference, and we will focus on uh, the adaptability of the deliverables of education in the 21st century. And the second session uh, of the first day will focus on uh, the importance of developing the different components of the education system. The uh, third session will uh, showcase uh, some international expertise in the field of education to spotlight uh, the uh, different aspects of those expertise and uh, experiences and learn from them. The fourth session will be a roundtable discussion that will have a host of uh, leading figures in the field of education to discuss the future prospects of education, given the technological revolution that has been ongoing globally, and to put forward recommendations that will ensure the development of the education process in a way that would cope with these uh, developments. Uh, and the conference will be concluded by declaring the main takeaways and recommendations given by the experts participating in this conference. Before I conclude my speech, please allow me to launch an initiative which is uh, given the uh, International uh, Day of Education, uh, which was uh, celebrated on the 24th of January, uh, let me declare Trans Initiative to distribute 5,000 books uh, that have been issued by Trans Center uh, among the different universities uh, and uh, libraries to spread knowledge and to boost the role of uh, education establishments by giving them these uh, highly important publications by Trans Center and boost the efforts of uh, young researchers. I, would wish, I wish you all the best uh, and I would like to express our full confidence that uh, the research papers and the individual ideas highlighted by the participants in this conference will achieve the objectives of this conference and peace be with all of you. Thank you for your insightful remarks, Dr. Mohammed. I'd like to announce that on the sidelines of this conference, we conducted a university student debate on the subject of education. Now we will show a video of the debate between the universities hosted by Trans. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, Nof Muhammad Al Fadli, the university student, who will present us with the future researcher remarks on the importance of debate skills. Nof, please welcome. Thank you. Distinguished guests, first of all, I would like to thank Trans Research and Advisory for the opportunity it provided us as university students to debate between each other on educational matters. As students, we have built upon this experience. For instance, debates are known to learn the ability to think critically and be spontaneous with their answers. It is also known that debate participation enhances innovative thinking and problem-solving skills. It also helps bridge words and ideas to form valid concepts during the debate. A smart debater should be able to focus on their main goal and not to stray from the main issue at hand, while also being reasonable and respectful to the opposing side. Accepting loss with grace is also an important aspect of being a successful debater, where it shows mental maturity and professionalism. Empathy is also an important skill to have for a debater. 
While a debater may not agree with the assigned argument, empathy helps debater to have a wider perspective of the matter and to not tr and to try to understand the people who agree with that argument. Composure and bias are also another important element for a good debater by effectively addressing the current assigned argument at hand. It is important to state that managing emotions is not only a helpful skill in debating, but also in everyday life situations. Emotions are important, but having emotional discipline during a debate is crucial to decide how to structure the current argument. Debate students are taught to exercise creativity and operate various forms of perspective in their persuasion to win the debate. We had the chance to implicate these skills last Monday in a friendly environment hosted by Trends. I believe that all students that participated in the debate had gained some kind of an experience and growth from it, where it gave us a chance to exchange our ideas and concepts with our colleagues from different universities. Beyond that, I believe that debaters tend to have successful careers, considering their advancing skills in research, reasoning, and public speaking capabilities. Also, by having these skills, debaters tend to be more resilient when faced with challenges in life. It has been a pleasure to, to meet all of you, and thank you so much. Thank you, Nof, and I wish you the best of luck. Now, I'd like to introduce the first panel titled Knowledge Development and the Requirements of the Global Age, Making Education Fit for Purpose in the 21st Century, which will be moderated by His Excellency, Dr. Saeed Al-Dahri, Director Center for Future Studies in University of Dubai. Please note, uh, the panelists will actually have a total of 50 minutes to present and then 15 minutes of open discussion. May the moderator and the panelists please proceed to the designated seating, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very delighted to be with you here today. Um, and, and this panel and uh, um, this conference about envisioning the future of education, uh, drivers of change uh, and innovation. Um, let me just introduce ourselves here in a short um, time, and then we'll start with the first panelist. panelist. Uh, my name is Saeed al Dahri, Dr. Saeed al Dahri. I'm the director for the Center of Future Studies from the University of Dubai. By the way, we just recently um, received UNESCO chair for the Center of Future Studies in anticipatory, um, um, anticipatory studies and um, um, a prosperous future. Uh, so I'm, I'm a co chair, and my colleague, Dr. Fawaz, is, is the chair um, for, for this um, post. Um, we have with us today here, um, first speaker, Her Excellency Mahra al -Mutaywi. This is going to be a pre-recorded presentation. Uh, so I think Mahra is going to talk for about uh, 10 minutes, probably. So let's um, watch uh, the, the recording and then we'll move to our next speaker, uh, Professor Daniel Kirk. Daniel is the Director of Academic Development at Mohammed bin Zayed uh, University of Artificial Intelligence. And we have with us also Dr. Fatma Al Anuti, um, which is Associate Professor at the Department of Natural Sciences and Public Health, Zayed University. So with that, let's start with the Her Excellency Mahra. Peace. Peace, please, please, I have a few to the participants in this conference. I'd like to welcome and greet all of you. May Almighty Allah grant you and grant you the success to serve our homeland. First and foremost, I'd like to express my appreciation to Trans Research and Advisory for the foundation to me and to the RCAP for this conference, which focuses on a very important topic 
which will go really is seeking to develop its capabilities in, namely education, and this conference uh, under the title of Envisioning the Future of Education, Drivers of Change and Innovation. The future of education is very important to all of us because based on, on education, all nations are built and the future generations are built to lead the, their homelands based on education. First, let's define the reasons why education is important because it is the pillar of uh, sustainable development and the main element for the development and progress of every country. This bill from the UAE and since it was established in the United Seventy One has paid special attention to education. The late Shizabh Sultan Ayan, the founder of the UAE, has used to speak about education extensively and how important it is to prepare the nation in terms of boosting its capabilities in developing a higher level of education for its people. He supports education not just in the UAE, but also at the regional level and supported other countries to boost the education systems in the UAE, he continued this approach, and we had the development and progress achieved by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed and Ahan, the President of the UAE, and his main focus on education as a very important uh, element uh, and factor in developing uh, the development and progress uh, plans in the UAE. Education is the main driver for uh, progress in our beloved homeland. And also, education leads the way in all GCC states. Uh, and because education is very important, it has been introduced as uh, a key component in all of the uh, visions of. Uh, our nations for the future and preparing future generations. So the uh, certain uh, view of the UAE 2021 uh, focuses on preparing new generations that will be equipped uh, with the necessary skills to deal with future developments. And the schools of the UAE should boost uh, innovation and uh, creativity and entrepreneurship. And also uh, enable and empower learners to deal with the future progress and development. The vision of Bahrain 2030, which focuses on uh, ensuring the highest level uh, of education for Bahraini citizens so they can acquire the necessary skills uh, to achieve their aspirations at the personal level, also uh, be able to achieve uh, the vision of the Kingdom of Bahrain at the national level. The uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia also has the 2030 vision, which uh, places uh, education at the forefront uh, of uh, the development of the economy as well. And that uh, uh, the uh, output or the levels of education in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia should uh, be able to deal with the changes in the future and cope with the future developments. And also to have uh, learners uh, capable of mastering the uh, skills of entrepreneurship and working at the national and international level. Also, the vision of Oman focuses on ensuring that the Sultanate of Oman has a high level of education and a very advanced one to boost uh, the uh, social partnership and have a comprehensive and independent education system that nurtures and boosts uh, uh, research and development and have uh, national uh, dynamic skills uh, that are highly competitive at the local and international level to lead the way for the future of uh, the Sultanate of Oman and also be able to be highly competitive at the global level Market. Also, Qatar has the 2030 vision, which focuses on ensuring that uh, the Qatari citizens have a very advanced level of education uh, that meets the needs of all Qatari citizens, and also establishing a highly advanced educational uh, system uh, at the national level. Kuwait also has a, uh, an education system which is considered the best in the region. It has a high quality deliverables. Uh, set of the rules and enables uh, the graduates uh, from the Kuwaiti education system to be highly competitive and capable of uh, competing at the international level as well. Moreover, education is uh, heart and center of the international agenda, as it is the key pillar of uh, the 17 SDGs. It is the fourth uh, objective of the SDGs, uh, the fourth goal, to achieve uh, or to ensure uh, high quality education to all students globally. It is the main driver for all the other SDGs, and it is the main uh, element that guarantees achieving all SDGs. And according to what happens in terms of education and the uh, ramifications of COVID-19 on uh, education, it has uh, become uh, the key element that has taken center stage at the agenda of uh, global development in the United Nations. In November 2021, declared that there will be 
an international summit that will focus on transforming education. It was uh, implemented and held in September 2022, and international uh, initiatives have brought education back uh, at the forefront of the national agenda and the regional and international agendas as well. Why do we have to improve the education systems? Because uh, education is a very critical element. It is a highly important one of the international agenda. No nation can achieve any progress without developing its education system. However, many studies uh, stress uh, the fact that we must have uneducated graduates uh, from the education system. One of the studies says that 50% of all employees will need uh, reskilling, upskilling their skills uh, by the year 2025, given the increasing reliance on technology. This is according to the uh, Future of Jobs report uh, that was issued recently. And also, uh, 50% of individuals who have less than a high school degree will be uh, employed in the OECD uh, countries. But this uh, ratio goes up to 75% for those who have higher degrees above uh, uh, higher education, above uh, high school. Uh, but this uh, level goes way up for those who have college degrees. So. Uh, we need to focus on the levels of education and uh, the education systems. How can we improve or enhance education systems? We need to focus on uh, the skills-based education. There's a system that uh, focuses on this, uh, learning creative skills and digital skills, uh, and life and work skills. Our education systems must support these skills and must underpin uh, acquiring these skills, such as critical thinking, uh, communication, innovation, creativity, and also uh, digital culture and media culture and IT and communication skills. Uh, the graduates of our education systems must have the, enough resilience uh, to be able to cope with the developments in the community and the future developments. They must have a sense of initiative and the, uh, the ability to learn on their own and be lifelong learners. They must have interaction skills and uh, uh, the ability to respect uh, different cultures. These are the most important top 10 skills that we will need by 2025. I will give you only an example of uh, how investment in a single skill, which is the problem solving skills and the uh, ROI on uh, the such skills. If we invest properly, the ROI will be uh, around uh, 45, 455 uh, billion US dollars. So investing in a simple skill would bring this massive uh, uh, revenue in this case. So imagine how far we can earn when we invest further in building the skills. How can we adapt to the levels of the degree systems with uh, the uh, requirements of uh, the job markets uh, uh, and all labor markets? So we need to adapt. Uh, uh, new learning technologies empower uh, human factors and uh, human capital in uh, the field of education. First, we're talking about the new mechanisms of assessment. We need to focus on three key pillars. First, systems for gathering data that will have a high level of accuracy, new uh, methods and methodology for assessment, and focusing on skills. We need to gather data of higher quality and more diverse. In this context, we need to gather more data about uh, uh, students' learning capabilities and skills basing skills acquiring capabilities to bridge the gap between education and what we want students to acquire. We must have new uh, methods for assessment of students to be able to gather more. Uh, uh, data of higher quality and to be able to use the education systems, we need to change our uh, assessment tools and adapt new ones that rely on self learning and uh, uh, training and uh, putting the learner in an real environment where he or she can exercise these skills. And this will enable us to pinpoint any gap that uh, the uh, students are uh, facing and what type of skills are required in the labor market. We need also to boost the uh, skill based education and integrate skills in new curricula and rely on new educational technology. We must use technology in a proper manner. We have technology around us, around us. So, the, therefore, we in the community must invest uh, the educational technology properly. 
uh, technology does not uh, increase the quality of education on its own. We must use the technological resources in boosting the education process to ensure that we have a comprehensive one and a highly integrated one uh, to meet the needs of uh, individual learners and therefore the learning opportunities and learning experiences will be more engaging for the learners and therefore they will benefit a lot more in terms of acquiring a large number of skills and also uh, boosting uh, the level of technology used in education. We have technology all around us, artificial intelligence, the so-called uh, the progress of technology. We must invest in this regard and uh, train teachers to use the technologies and invest into the platforms that support such technologies. Also, empowerment of human capital operating in the field of education. First, we must invest in the professional development of teachers and the human resources operating in the field of education to be able to boost the teaching and learning uh, strategies. A study has pointed out that when we invest in developing uh, teachers' skills, uh, the ROI at the international level will go uh, uh, up by 4 billion per year. Per year. 4 billion per year if we continue to develop their skills uh, and enhance the technological uh, strategies. This will have a massive ROI in terms of education. Teachers proved during the pandemic that they are the uh, backbone of the education process. The education process cannot continue to be efficient without uh, efficient teachers. Therefore, we must uh, be highly selective in terms of uh, selecting teachers and training them and enabling them to adapt to the latest developments around them by adopting technology and using state-of-the-art technologies and modern pedagogical approaches and also using the proper uh, human resources uh, planning this regard and clear uh, recruitment and selection policies, the human resources entering into the field of education through teachers' uh, qualification systems and uh, providing the proper policies in this regard and selection of uh, uh, teachers' property and also enhancing the skills of uh, teachers teachers already operating in this domain and also boosting the quality of life for teachers. These are the most important elements that education systems must focus on to adapt the deliverables of the education system to the requirements of the future and making them more resilient to adapt to future needs. So, what we learned or the learned lessons in the COVID-19 pandemic, one of the positive things that we learned or the positive takeaways from the pandemic uh, is that it made us deal with the challenges. Uh, it made our uh, education systems more resilient uh, and more capable of uh, handling such challenges. That is why adaptability and resilience has become more easier to acquire for education systems. And this uh, will boost its adaptability and its uh, capability to deal with a changing future. Thank you for your kind attendance. Uh, I would like to conclude uh, by thanking once again uh, Trends Research and Advisory uh, good for uh, and thank uh, you. sending me this invitation and giving me this platform uh, to, speak, uh, to participate uh, with you who, uh, and to I've be, thank, their you, work for the thank last you very much years and be peace with you. Social media and keep popping up at book fairs and places around the world so I'm very, very happy to be here and be a small part of it. Um, let's begin with what seems like a really obvious statement. Right? Our world is rapidly changing. Uh, and it's crucial that our education system evolves to meet the needs of the 21st century. I also want to just caution us, we're talking about the needs of the 21st century. We're already one fifth of the way through it. So we're already thinking about what's coming next. We're moving towards the mid-century, end of century approach. And education, as you know, is like turning a cruise ship. It takes a lot of time and a lot of space. And so we need to start thinking very quickly about how we're going to leverage uh, the time that we have uh, in this in this changing world. Another statement which seems really obvious, but we keep sometimes forgetting, is that education is the foundation of any successful society. It develops and prepares the next generation of citizens who will build upon the successes of those who went before. And just hearing from our, our student and about the student debate, that's a classic example of how education has a role to prepare the next generation, not just for the labour market, but the next generation of thinkers and the next generation of innovators. So in today's rapidly, I'm going to try and read through this because otherwise I'm a teacher and I go off track and I'll talk forever. Um, in today's rapidly changing world, 
It's more important than ever that education drives social and cultural change, not merely being passive and reactive, but involved and purpose-driven. The world is becoming increasingly interconnected and interdependent, and this requires a new approach to education that is flexible, adaptable, and responsive to the changing needs of society, whilst also being a driver for social change. As we all know, the world is changing around us in ways that had not been imagined several decades ago. And with that, the demands on education and the skills required to succeed in the 21st century and beyond become imperatives to success and the global competition amongst nation states. The traditional model of education, which emphasised rote memorisation and passive learning, is no longer sufficient to meet the needs of a rapidly evolving global economy. Historically, education has bent and shaped to fit a social understanding of the purpose of education. In the future, and I would argue now, because now is the future, education will take a larger role itself in shaping society, and the role of technology will be at the forefront of that new paradigm. In order to make education fit for purpose in the 21st century, we must embrace a new approach to knowledge development that emphasizes critical thinking, problem solving and creativity. This is all stuff you know, right? This is all stuff we're talking about. This requires a shift away from traditional teaching methods towards student-centered experiential learning opportunities that encourage students to take an active role in their own education. One of the biggest challenges and opportunities faced in edu education today is the rapid pace of technological change. I'm at a university focused solely on artificial intelligence, so forgive me that we're going to have a little bit of a technological bent to this. The internet and digital technologies have transformed the way we access and process information. It's essential that our education systems keep pace with these changes. Currently, you've all seen in the media, you're probably using it yourself, discussions are focused on platforms such as chat, GPT the latest in a long line of technologies that are causing the education sector to scratch its head. There's much discussion about the role of AI in education and the fear it may lead to the dumbing down of educational skills and that AI may be used as a way for students to somehow cheat the system. But these same fears were vocalised during the growth years of the World Wide Web, right? Search engines such as Google, AOL and others were seen as a threat to the education system. Yet search engines and the internet as a resource for education is now the norm, applauded and promoted and widely used in formal education settings. My concern is that as new technologies emerge, as AI continues to develop and become more sophisticated and useful, many in the education sector will seek to resist and perhaps forbid even its use in the teaching and learning process. However, rather than see such new technologies as a way for students to somehow beat or cheat the system, we must quickly, quickly acknowledge and recognise that these tools are the system, which students and others are already using to meet their educational and social needs. So we need to embrace emerging technologies and use them to aid the learning process, not fear their presence. The traditional and historical model of education, which our current systems are still modelled on, is no longer enough and thankfully is a model we're seeing deployed less and less. We need to equip our students with the skills they need to navigate an ever-changing digital landscape. They need to be able to adapt to new technologies as they emerge, drive and seek new ways to make use of the technology as it develops, and as the ultimate end user in an education system, our students need to see value and worth in the process and efficacy with the tools they have at their disposal. When I was a school student, we won't say how long ago, handheld digital calculators were still relatively new, something many teachers I had resisted, and often they were banned in our classrooms, being seen as a way of weakening traditional math skills. As educators now, we see their value, their use, and that they're tools to aid teaching and learning, not something that subsumes the process. So as new technologies emerge, we must embrace and adapt, for this is how new knowledge paradigm shifts and ways of working and knowing develop and take flight. 
The development of knowledge has been a central focus for education over the centuries, and I want to pause and reframe the notion here of knowledge slightly. Over the past two decades, there's been a focus on the knowledge economy. In this part of the world particularly, in fact, when I was at ECSSR, I wrote a lot about the knowledge economy. And building new and building new economic models around understanding, understanding and the new ways of new ways of knowing. We need to we need to think in terms of I would argue. I would argue one that increases one that increases the knowledge the knowledge of knowledge economy knowledge societies societies the way cultures the way cultures and social groups acquire acquire use make real make real you understand you understand perfect their purpose. So the nature of so knowledge, nature or, of knowledge or, or perhaps more knowledge, is, knowledge is, and the way in which and the way in which it has acquired and has changed has significantly, significantly in recent years, years we need something we need to be mindful of. In the past, in the past, the knowledge was seen as unchanging, unchanging. Today, knowledge is seen as knowledge is seen as dynamically, constantly evolving. This requires a new requires a new approach to education, flexible, able to and able to adapt in changing circumstances. Another challenge, another challenge facing education, education is the diversity, diversity, fluidity, fluidity movement, of movement of the global population. Global population. In a truly modern, truly global modern global age, age educate, educate students from a wide range of backgrounds, with varying levels, with varying levels, levels of educational, of educational, educational attainment, attainment, and with different, and with different and with cultural, different perspectives, cultural perspectives, and perspectives and norms. This requires this a flexible, requires and, flexible and inclusive, and inclusive approach to education that values and celebrates diversity and that provides an equal opportunity to students all students to succeed. Technology, technology, and for level. The full leveler. However, access however, and accessibility and adaptability will remain challenged with true digital, with true digital playing, field. Field. playing field. With vast, with vast, vast swathes of the global, global population without access, without access to digital, digital, frontiers. digital frontiers. One of the key requirements, one of the, key requirements, of the, requirements of the is the ability is the ability to think creatively and, creative and to collaborate, and to collaborate effectively, effectively with diverse, with diverse backgrounds. This requires this deep requires a deep understanding of cultures and perspectives, and ability to ability to communicate effectively across boundaries. To meet these to meet these requirements, education makes a more makes a more interdisciplinary approach that integrates that integrates multiple fields, multiple fields, perspectives, and traditions and traditions while preparing while preparing for students to work in diverse teams, diverse teams, drawing on drawing on different strengths and, strength and, strength and, strength and a positive. This requires this requires a curriculum that allows them that allows students to explore multiple multiple disciplines and to pursue their passions, their interests and interests, moving away moving away from all domains domains concept areas concept education education and assessment and assess both in K both in K twelve and in higher education. We cannot under cannot underestimate the role technology AI will have on the future of teaching teaching and learning teaching and learning technologies technologies such as GPT are not ways are not ways to cheat the system but are becoming the becoming the system. Education must education must recognise, recognise this and support this. Students are already students using are already these using technologies, technologies that have not that, that have not hit the that have not hit the formal education space, education yet. space yet. And to ignore and to ignore them, them or even dismiss worse, them, dismiss them means we're in danger means we're in danger of generation of generation of students and risk alienating risk alienating education education sector altogether. After all, if After you can all, access you can what you access need to meet your, meet your goals, goals in an arena, outside, outside, outside of education, education, you will begin to you will question the question of the relevant very education, very education system. system. So to remain so engaged, to remain engaged relevant, and fit, relevant and fit for education is to prioritise the and utilisation of digital literacy, digital literacy and, technolo and technological, technological skills. skills. In today's world, in today's world, technology is transforming every aspect of our lives. Students must be prepared to use technology in a meaningful way to solve complex problems while ensuring while ensuring use that drives development. development. To meet these challenges, meet these challenges students, students be must educate more students more students, more students on, on the real world, world, on real world problem, problem solving. Students should be encouraged should be encouraged to develop think, critical thinking, creativity, creativity, ability to work, ability to work collaboratively, and all the things and all the things that are not necessarily, necessarily easy, to easy to do, and are often cramped, cramped very, si very siloed and space in our schools and universities. And universities. Students must students must that they demand they demand they be equipped they be skills with skills necessary to speed in a rapidly changing labour market, including including. Digital literacy, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial skills, skills and understanding of sustainability and ethical issues. issues. The education, the education sector will need to change its approach to assessment. Traditional forms, traditional forms of assessment, and exams, and exams, and essays are no longer enough to evaluate the skills and knowledge of 21st century students. And, century students. and far too often, far too often, it's often a only a snapshot in that individual, that individual, missing out, missing out less tangible, less tangible, tangible learning and understanding that's going on. We need to embrace, need new, to embrace forms new forms of assessment that are better suited to the demands of the global age, including project-based project online, portfolio, online portfolios, student-driven projects, and digital, and badges. digital badges. 
nearly there. It's like nearly a wedding. There. It's like a wedding. I'm nearly there. I'm nearly there. In order to meet, in the order to meet the more than just the acquisition of knowledge, it needs to provide needs to provide skills and skills and ability to speak whatever whatever success looks like for that individual. Education, education has an imperative to be more accessible and inclusive. The rise of technology is now possible for people to access a wide wide range of experiences and experiences and learning without the need without the need based place based or access or access. This new way of this new way of engaging with the learning process and novel approach novel approach to education takes into takes into account the needs of diverse and diverse backgrounds with different needs different needs and aspirations. COVID, COVID, someone had to mention it, COVID, it. COVID has given the education, given the education sector, sector a, a lifetime, a lifetime, or a, a once or in a century a opportunity to pause and rethink the way in which education functions. We've all heard post COVID about going back to normal, but I don't want education to go back to normal because normal was not that great. I want us to rethink and reset the education sector in this particular moment that we have and the ability to do that. So finally, education needs to be more focused on the future and prioritise the development of a global perspective and the ability to think critically about the impact of global issues such as climate change, economic inequality and political instability. This means preparing students for the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead and ensuring that they have the skills and knowledge they need to succeed in this rapidly changing world. This requires a deep understanding of the interconnectedness of, of the world and the commitment to using education as a tool for social change. In conclusion, you'll be pleased, moderator, in conclusion, to make education fit for purpose in the 21st century, we must embrace a new approach to knowledge development that emphasizes critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, interdisciplinary learning, digital literacy, and a global perspective. This requires a new approach to education that is flexible, adaptable, and responsive to the changing needs of society. By doing this, we can ensure our students are prepared to succeed in a forever changing world to make a, and to make a positive impact. The challenges facing education in the 21st century are significant, but they're not insurmountable. By embracing technology, valuing diversity and adopting a student-centered approach, we can ensure that our education system is fit for purpose in a global age. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Daniel. Wow, this is, this is a lot. A you, you, yes, <laughs> uh, a lot to grasp in such a short time. Definitely, you touched upon many, many issues here and points. You know, them. not easy when we speak about education. Really, how, how to adapt and 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 how to change. I mean, took countries years, probably you know, ages um, for countries to develop. I, I remember attended the, the global at the world the world government summit mm. was in two thousand seventeen. And we had, uh, I think, invited the Minister of Education in, in South Korea. And in Korea, he, and he mentioned this, that it took them around 60 years, or more than 50 years, really, to, to reach where they, where they, where they reached at, you know, at the moment. And every phase took them around 15 years. So when you put a strategy, you need to, you need to wait and you need to you know, show results you know, for, for, for things to happen. So it took them four phases, each phase around 15 years, really to accomplish what they accomplished. I remember I was, uh, 2019, we visited Finland, was part of uh, what's called the CIO visit, an innovation visit that we took some CIOs from the public and private sector here in the UAE. And every, country, and every, every year we go visit a country. So we visited Finland. In 2019, Finland celebrated their 100th anniversary course, taking uh, uh, from, um, from Soviet Union. And in 100 years, if you look into the education system in Finland, Finland was about what, I think third or fourth um, worldwide, globally, in terms of, uh, of education. So it took Finland around 100 years to be number, th number three or number four in education. Of course, UAE has celebrated last um 2021 celebrated the 50th anniversary we had a very ambitious um vision for the centennial plan by 2071 the country and our leadership wanted to be number one in the world to have the best education system in the world and i think that is not impossible um uh, we have 
we have a vision from the leadership and we have also passion from the executives to achieve what you know what the country wants and what the leadership want to achieve um, we're going to come back again to the to the question i just wanted to share with you some of the thoughts when when daniel was speaking about the different issues that he touched upon in terms of the challenges that facing today the education system the student-centered approach the interdisciplinary approach that we need of course to embrace when it comes to the uh, to, to education the skills that the students need you know going looking back again to the to the report by the by the world economic forum which which came out of future of jobs report in 2000 the first version of that report came in 2016 and at that time they were saying that 65 percent of the newly born children by that time by 2016 so talking about what eight years ago when they're going to graduate from when they're going to finish high school or when they're going to graduate from the university they will be working in jobs that does not exist you know today so looking into the future job market and what the students need of course to have in terms of skills that is that is really very important and having an educational system that is flexible like i said and adaptable and i think that is one of the challenges that is facing you know education systems today uh, i'm gonna go next to to my colleague here dr fatma lanuti to share with us with us her thought about you know the future of education and how we can see this education changing within the next um uh, in the 21st century so to you uh, Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be at Trans. Uh, thank you for this nice invitation. It's very nice also to see the STARS alumni, some of our alumni, including Alia. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't think uh, Professor Daniel left anything for me. <laughs> um, I really share the same views um, in terms of like emphasizing certain important uh, concepts, certain important points. Um, of how to engage the youth in um, taking a decision over their own education, involve them as also stakeholders because we can see their perspective. I would like to also maybe take a different direction and uh, provide some, some of the examples or share some of the best practices in terms of how we can accomplish uh, or achieve sustainability and um, environmental education at a higher level. Uh, by partnership, uh, partnership between the faculty, the students, legislators, using technology, embracing change, uh, transforming to interdisciplinary approach. You know, all of this it comes together um, to to guide the change. Um, the interesting and unique feature about higher education universities, for example, is that they are positioned at a, an amazing opportunity because they can drive the change. Um, so if you talk about sustainability, for instance, you cannot really achieve sustainability by just looking at technology, um, looking at legislators. You need to involve another link. That third link is about society. And in society, we have people and we have communication. So education, higher education specifically, is um, the vehicle of change that can drive all of this process. And this is how we can link all the different pieces of the puzzle together. Um, what we try to do in, in academia is, is really something very valuable. And um, because we have to embrace change, as Professor uh, Daniel just mentioned, uh, and keep up the pace of, of change for the real life uh, situations, um, we can accomplish this with what we call REAP. R-E-A-P. And I really like this because it's an acronym, but at the same time, it reminds us of um, like how you sow a seed and you reap it. So it has also an environmental dimension. At the same time, it stands for resilience, uh, engagement, action, and partnership. I like to emphasize these because these are four important pillars that we need in order to accomplish uh, environmental education and in order to accomplish, you know, um, awareness about certain topics related to environment like climate change, etc. Um, so if you're not resilient, start with like resilience. If you're not resilient, uh, you cannot move forward. And um, I, I can just, you know, um, take an example from myself. 
Um, many years ago, I was very resistant to embracing social media and using it as a tool to engage my students. I mean, now I can I look back and I I think, oh, I've lost so much time. Should have used it long time ago. Um, the slightest example is like if you go to a lab setting, you can simply engage the students more by asking them to create. First thing, I ask them create an Instagram account. And they start like just, you know, who wants to do it first? They, they just start racing. Like, I want to do it. I want to do it. So I was at the beginning, I was really resistant. But now I, I just realized that by being resilient, you start to understand, you know, a different perspective. You start to think uh, outside the box. Um, another thing is to really engage the students and engage the youth. I really liked, it was really capturing for me. I um, like the logo here and the motto of uh, trends. It was investing in the youth because it's like investing in the future is investing in the youth. And um, we have to believe in the youth because they are the drivers of the change. They are the drivers of the success. And if we don't engage them, we we don't we will be in silos like we will not know uh, what would be the heart of a problem and we won't know how to discover the solution for a problem so engaging them is very important as well um, one of the examples also professor daniel mentioned something very important about the experiential learning we noticed for instance at zaid university that if you um, include experiential learning it's really like a game changer uh, we had an opportunity a couple of years ago um, to partner with UNESCO and um, we uh, proposed a binational excursion for our students in the environmental science uh, and sustainability stream. And these students were part of an exchange program uh, between some students in Ethiopia and some students in the UAE. So it was it had like cultural aspect, first of all. The second aspect was more of like a problem-based uh, dimension because the students um, that were our UAE students that went to Ethiopia, they were assigned um, a multiplier project. So they were taken to an area that was affected by floods and they had problems with the water. And they were, you know, um, teamed up with uh, the uh, their counterparts uh, from Ethiopia and they were uh, given a task to come up with a solution. They had to live in this village for a couple of weeks, for three weeks, actually. And um, they had to study the environment. They had to um, research and finally come up with um, a real life uh, a solution for, for um, the people in the village. Um, so these students, when they came back, they were sharing their experiences and they were... Uh, all the students who were listening to them, they were just very inspired and they were motivated. Um, the second year, many students were asking me to repeat the experience. And same thing, you know, like every year they keep asking for experiential um, um, experiences, learning and so on. So going back, we have action as well. Like if we just, you know, um, leave it to theoretical or um, we, we just um, propose and we don't do any action, it's not going to move forward again. So we need to implement with an action. And in order to implement with an action, sometimes you need to partner. So you need to find partnership. And this is also something that we have done. We partners, for example, in a lot of our initiatives with the environmental agency. Um, so they had an initiative called the Sustainable Campus Initiative, and this initiative was extremely useful for us. It was actually a win-win situation for both of us because we, uh, we looked at this initiative and we had to slightly change our uh, curriculum and our programs because, first of all, we included some of the sustainability pillars and some of the uh, principles of sustainability into our courses and into our curriculum. And we also offered students a chance to uh, act by um, a, a project, by problem-based learning. Again, you know, going and touching back on, on those important concepts. What the students had to do um, is, is to implement a project in their campus. 
So um, they had two different um, uh, goals. First goal was to uh, minimize the uh, the level of uh, CO2 emission in, on campus. And um, another one was to do an audit, to um, really be familiar with the environment and have a baseline of like a level of the pollution, for example, that is caused uh, within the uh, campus and keep this as a database, um, like to monitor, because it's very important, go back also to the assessment. It's very important to assess your success. So uh, the students had to uh, collect data, baseline data about you know, contamination in the air, um, how much energy is being consumed, how much water, etc. And then the second year, they they had one whole year to come up with a project that will minimize, for example, the energy loss or uh, minimize or lower the level of CO2 uh, emission and so on. So it was important to first, as a first step, to really establish a database. Um, one of the very creative projects I remember by one of the students, I don't remember if it was Alia's uh, group, um, but it was, uh, they came up with a project called Shayarna Local. Sh Sh I'm sh sorry, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Sh Shayarna or Shayarna, but it's like the trees. Yeah, the trees, the trees. And um, it's um, what they did, they took uh, a lot from um, in ca on campus and they um, removed all the plants that were uh, not endemic. And they planted endemic plants and they calculated, you know, how much water they have uh, saved by planting uh, endemic plants. So that was, you know, a very eye opener uh, project. The students enjoyed, they learned. And at the same time, you know, we accomplished this by partnership with the legislators because we had to ask for approvals like uh, from the administration, from the leadership. And also we had um, the, the support of the environmental agency. So again, you know, by working together, um, uh, you could accomplish a lot by working together. Um, lastly, um, also like the clubs, uh, student associations are extremely important. And uh, without the student associations, without clubs, without uh, participation and uh, communicating with the community, um, this link that I spoke about in terms of linking the society with technology, with um, uh, legislators, it's not going to be accomplished. So uh, we also try to empower the youth by um, taking part in these um, associations and the clubs. And actually, I was the first in Zaid University to propose the digital badge system. So I proposed a digital batch system. In the beginning, the students hated it because, you know, we had to link it. We wanted to motivate the students to be more engaged. And we noticed that some are getting engaged, but not enough. We wanted to motivate them to be more engaged. So we said that, okay, in order to, to move forward for your internship, you have to earn 15 badges. Uh, and and the um, to earn the 15 badges you have to do you know that much and you have to do uh, you have to be engaged in many activities and so on so that was also um, an example maybe of a successful uh, experience by the um, higher education lastly i i want to share also um, some of the conferences some of the platforms that we have uh, used uh, for instance, like we partner with uh, New York University, Abu Dhabi, and other universities in, in the UAE uh, to propose the um, higher education uh, climate dialogue. This is an interesting platform where the students themselves, like this is led entirely by the students and the faculty are moderators. Um, and so they they take turns, like students from different universities, they share their experiences, they share their, um, they debate, you know, uh, going back to Nuf's uh, important uh, role about debate, they debate about um, certain uh, topics, uh, especially we try to link it to the environment and the climate change. Um, and the last thing, I keep saying lastly, sorry. <laughs> 
Lastly, I would like to really uh, draw your attention, especially uh, you all as youth, uh, would like to um, invite you to take part in, in uh, what we call the World uh, Environment Education Congress. That's happening, I'm not sure if you know, but it's happening in Abu Dhabi next year. And it's being uh, spearheaded by uh, the Environmental Agency and the Crown Prince Court. And it's, again, it's an amazing opportunity for the youth to be engaged. We have different themes. Uh, you can check the website um, and see if you're interested in volunteering because only by engaging the youth, we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fatma. I think you, you highlighted the very um, um, important points here with the model that you spoke about, this REAP model, okay, which is touches on resilience and we saw during COVID and after COVID like you know how we can be really resilient in, in life because the purpose of education and I might differ here with the with the new with the with what the big tick wants to enforce on us in terms of non-degree versus degrees or going to it's good to go for micro credentials and take some courses here and there and certain to build up certain skills but I believe that the purpose of education is really to build the well-rounded personality. The personality that will go through life, that will go through hardship, and they will be able to withstand, and they will be able to navigate, you know, life changes event, wherever that takes. You need to, so, so the points of lifelong learning becomes here really very important. So it's all about resilience. And this is probably students need to also put emphasis from their, from their side to be lifelong learning, uh, learners uh, and, and, and to look into how they can build this resilience uh, okay, into, into, into their skills, of course, with the help probably from schools and you talked also about how you engage with the students and 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 what actions that they need to take in the partnerships we embarked last year as a center of future studies here in dubai in a study we call it the future of higher education 2050 haven't published the report yet but uh, it's interesting to to see what's happening we have engaged with the uh, with many uh, let's say let's say educational experts from around the world we, we engaged with people from University of Cambridge and from China, from Italy, from the UAE. We had interviewed some chancellors at university, Dr. Professor Abdel Latif Shamsi at that time. He was the head of HCT, Dr. Isal Bastiki, the university where I come from, University of Dubai. And we looked into the signals of change, like what's happening? What are the signs and the signals that are going to impact education, higher education in the next, let's say, 30 years, because the timeline was 2050, the future of higher education into 2050. And we looked into the, all the dimensions, technological disruptions, political, economical, environmental, um, and, and we look, we assessed around 50 signals of change, and then we asked the expert, the domain expert, to rank those signals of change, you know, according to the uncertainty. This is what we do in future studies. We try to rank those signals of change according to the impact, their impact and the uncertainties, and then draw, draw scenarios like what the future will be for the universities, how universities need to adapt in terms of all those changes that we see. And we came up with four different scenarios. One we called it the lifelong learning scenarios, like where, you know, Education is flourishing, uh, students embracing lifelong learning. And some of the concepts which kept really repeating very important elements, which I thought about when, which when I think about it, is education has to feed the brain, we call it head, had, has to touch the heart, head, heart, and has to engage hands. So one concept is this head, heart, and hand. A head, heart, and hands. So yes, needs to feed the brain. Need need to make us cautious about what we're learning. And he too also has to touch our heart, so we can be really passionate of what we do. And of course, has to engage in in, in our hands. And another approach, of course, is called live live live, live learn a lot. Uh, live 
love and learn okay live love and learn and this is the the new when you look into the things that we said and daniel probably highlighted this about you know what things are going to change after covid and how we can see this taking us into new reality is that now students they have they they look into the values and they look also into the values of institutions so we see that they're going to go to the institutions which really serves their values they are not and, and we see this changing with the with the with the demographics we see this changing with the new generations ginzers and 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 alpha generations and so forth so definitely the education has to change in terms of institutions a curriculum has to be adapted and maybe this is maybe one of the questions which i would like to probably ask daniel when you spoke about you know flexibility and adaptive and, and an adaptability of education system how you can see daniel this is this is this is happening what institutions need you know to do in terms of 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 the changing the dynamics that we see now you know it's not easy when you go to the universities and you ask them you know to improve or provide a new curriculum it takes just ages for the educational system to change so how you can see we can build this flexibility and adaptability daniel yeah thank you um, if if i have a if i have an answer i'll walk out the door of a very rich man but we'll try and we'll try and do it so um part of the problem is is uh, around the world we have education systems that see themselves as producers so you know uh, i have just anecdotally i have a nephew some nephews in the us and when they were looking to go to university their mother said you can go to university and study anything you want but you need to come out and say at the end of it i am a fill in the blank so we have an education system that that is a production model. You come out with something, right? You come out in the British system with GCSEs and A-levels, in the US system with a high school diploma, with an IB. At university, we all say, oh, my degree is in X. I'm a literature major, I'm a doctor, I'm whatever it might be. Well, what that does is it naturally silos education, right? Because we, we naturally drop, or we don't naturally, but we drop people into silos at a very early age, particularly when they're making decisions around careers and around higher education. You apply to a university to do a degree normally in X or Y. So we're already narrowing it. Now, this is where the problem comes, but we also have education systems that, demand that they produce because we have societies that demand they produce as a father of two daughters i want my kids to go through school and university getting the skills they need to be successful but to do that it's really frightening to say so just go play just go do whatever you want go to school go to university and just do whatever you like and see what happens we don't have the structure for that what we need is a really a, a, a complete reset of the way we look at education systems their funding their models their purpose and the way students move through those systems this is almost impossible because we're dealing with a mass model we're not dealing with individuals when we're talking about public school systems and governmental school systems we're talking about a system that is there for everyone in that country so how do you personalize the unpersonable that's the crux now I don't, unfortunately, doctor, I don't have an answer. But but it, the more you can get to the experiential learning, the personalised learning, and the student taking control and having control of their own path. So we need in schools to break down barriers. We need to stop building schools around departments. We need to stop building schools that are boxes that we put 30 people in and expect learning to happen. When you were in Finland, I'm sure you saw some amazing schools. The, the, the school design is a big part of it. So we have to rethink that. Now, it's very difficult, but earlier when we were talking, you said about policy you know, recommendations, bold, bold policy that says, you know what? We're gonna, we're gonna start with a blank page and we're gonna try. And it's dangerous and it's frightening because we could play around with education and tinker with it and try new models. The kids going through it only get one time. So if it doesn't work, the fear is you've ruined the futures potentially of those kids. So it's bold leadership, bold models, but the willingness to fail and understand that failure in itself can be success and can be a learning opportunity. It's very difficult to do on a macro level, but you probably saw in Finland, certainly in Korea, there's a few model schools in the US 
that are generally independent, but they're trying that. And just we just need to see what, what comes out of that. So that's really sort of a non-answer <laughs> to your question. <laughs> Interesting. When, when, when I look into the model that you spoke about, um, Dr. Fatma, about the REAP model, where you see this, this model being applied and, and what were the, the outcome if has, if has been applied somewhere? What were the outcome of this, you know, of applying this model? At least maybe, you know, is there any 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 results that came out of it when, or is this something a new concept that that you were talking about? Thank you so much. This was actually a model that I proposed, by by, by observing. <laughs> I mean, I I proposed this model, uh, but I also really observed that in order to succeed, uh, you have to um, integrate something like that. And um, and it came from experience, really, it just came from experience. I linked it mostly to um, how, I, how it all started. It started with the observation that assessments are not very useful. The, the old assessments that we're using, like, you know, traditional exam or quiz or whatever like formal uh, type of assessment was not really working well. And that, you know, that was uh, kind of uh, the, the eye opener for me that I started observing different models and I started thinking, um, so is the problem the assessment or is the, the problem rooted somewhere else? And then I started thinking, oh, it's, it's not because only assessment. Okay, assessment is one part of it, but it's probably because we're not engaging the youth. Uh, not engaging them also requires like resilience because as I said, like, you know, we have to embrace, for example, technology. And this is how it all started. Like, I started thinking about putting all these pieces together and um, observing that uh, successful models really had all these different pillars. Dr. Fatma, I, I forgot to mention that actually I'm speaking on 28th of this month with the ESSR um, about about this study which I which which I spoke about the future of higher education. It's gonna we're gonna present the results. It's gonna be in Arabic. I'm sorry, but maybe there will be some translation. Um, but yeah, I mean we we looking to to produce the report in association with the University of um, of, of of Cambridge. Um, just want to share with you, I mean, we're going through this disruption now, and you, Daniel, you highlighted this, that when you see, you know, these innovations coming, for example, and disruptions such as chat GBT, you know, how we react, do, do we close the doors and do we try to stop these, these, these disruptions or we try to em embrace them? So what do you think, Daniel and, and, and Dr. Fatma, when it comes to, you know, I've, I've, I just want to share with you some of the things which I, which I, when I tried to inquire ChatGPT and and ask, so I asked ChatGPT, okay, because again of the of of the theme of the com of this conference, what do you think are the main drivers of knowledge development in the 21st century? And look what look what came from this ChatGPT, technological technological advancement and innovation as one of the drivers, globalization and interconnectivity the changing nature of work and job market, the growing importance of data and information management, increased demand for lifelong learning and professional development, a shift towards interdisciplinary uh, and collaborative approach to problem solving, the need for critical thinking, creativity and innovation, the influence of social and cultural factors on the acquisition and dissemination of knowledge. When you, when you read this, this makes sense, right? And, and if, if I tried to to come up with this answer, probably would have taken me, I don't know, a couple of hours trying to search the net and trying to put these together. And this came in but in a what in, in, in about a minute. I was I was doing a workshop this morning with the with the customs department in Dubai and talking about, you know, how technological innovations and how digital transformation is helping. So I went in front of them and I inquired Chat GBT. What are the customs officers need? What are the skills, you know, the customs officers need to have, you know, in, in this dynamic and, you know, changing world? And it's amazing the answer that I got and for them to, and to, to, to read the answers. And they says, wow, are you talking to an expert here or what? 
So yes, definitely we see this disruptions coming and you know, do we want to do, shall we stop it and we stop our children from using it or we need to embrace it, but then think how we're going to assist, how we're going to assist our children. So your feedback, Daniel, on this. And so, um, so I wish I'd put that in chat GPT and I, I maybe would have saved you all of uh, listening to me. I could have just come up with some points. Um, so no, I, I'm a firm believer. We don't try and, and, and control and close down these avenues, right? One thing we need to remember with all these technologies, chat GPT being sort of the one that's in the media at the moment, but there are, there are other AI um, programs out there that do similar things. These have been created by individuals, these have been created by humanity, by us, by people. They're not something out in the in the sort of the global, you know, stratosphere that have just been landed upon us, and they serve a very a very real function. In an education system, we learn from history that the minute we try and close something down, it just drives it underground, and it just creates more issues for us as an education system. I I'd, I'd, I'd wanna I wanna be. But I want to be careful with that word system because I don't think we have an education system anymore. We have multiple modes of education and chat GPT and, and similar programming op op opportunities and similar um, uh, platforms are the system. That's what our students are using. So if we decide to try and, and, and there was a school in Victoria in the US or the Victorian state school system, sorry, in, in Australia have just banned chat GPT in their schools while they try and figure out what to do. Worst thing they could have done. What they should have said is to the end user, which is a student, right, let's play with it. Let's see what it can do, what it can't do, and let's use it as a tool for learning and, and take that bold step. So no, I'm, I'm not a fan of closing technologies or any access down for students. They will, or in the education system, students will use the tools they need to succeed. And if that's one of them, we should embrace it. As a teacher, I was a school teacher before I was a, in, in higher ed. My job was, was not to teach literature, which is my area. My job was to help that child find their place in the world. And anything that we can do to support that must be embraced. And I think these technologies are part of that. Thank you, Daniel. And this also brings, I'm, I'm not saying here that chat GPT is a perfect. Again, chat GPT has, has its flaws as well. There is a, when it comes to fact, chat, D, chat GPT is really, um, you know, very, very worse when it comes to fact. But not only this, when we speak about the new, these large language models, and we look into, it touches upon, upon, upon the very essence of our, of our ethics. Look, for example, what stable diffusion and, you know, mid journey and then DALI, these large language models. Now, stable diffusion is being sued because, and this is when it comes, I'm, I'm a pro data ethics because I got a certification lately in data ethics. So I'm a data ethics facilitator, but I believe that, and, and what's strange, maybe, you know, ChatGBT did not mention anything about, about ethics, but whatever we do now with the technology, it has implications in society. And if we're not aware of the ethical issues, like what happened with the stable diffusion and many of these large, large, large language models, when you train an AI, large language models, on a style of an artist, like a Picasso or an artist, and someone else comes with a prompt and tells this AI program to generate an art based on Picasso, or maybe an artist who is living and his, his life depends on the, on the style that he's doing. And without taking the consent of this person, okay, you, and for the sake of making money, because the companies, you know, want to make money, then we get these ethical issues. And now stable diffusions and, and also, you know, the, uh, the open AI with the co-pilot um, um, system that, that Microsoft and open AI uh, have, have launched are being sued as well because they trained their algorithms on data without taking consents from people, such as people's, you know, rights. Uh, and, and this is what happens when you don't think on the consequences and when without taking consideration, you know, data ethics. So it becomes really very important now when we look into these models and we're going to see a lot of problems, I think, come, is going to come out of these, uh, of these, of these uh, you know, uh, large language models. Um, I think we need to conclude, but, you know, let me just, let's go 
one quick round, Daniel and then Dr. Fatma. Give us your, your thought about what conclusions or what recommendations that you can give, we can take forward really. I know this is the subject is really very difficult and maybe in such a short time, we cannot put this together, but, but something that really we need to take and we need to think about it and we need probably to say, okay, this is what, how we want to develop our education system in the future. Uh, yeah, thank you. I've, really quickly, um, we need policymakers to be bold. We need policymakers to think outside the box, not just metaphorically, but literally, because we're still building schools that are just boxes and we just pour people in and think learning will happen. So policymakers to be bold, make that, uh, make that step. And innovation comes through learning. It comes through failure. There were 27 versions of the original iPod before the one went to market. That's 26 times they failed. But look at the success of iPod, or, or, or what it was, we don't have iPods anymore, but look at the success of Apple on the back of that. So um, I think we need policymakers who are brave and bold, but can also tell the story of why they're doing it. Not just change for change's sake, but change because it's really what society needs. I, mean, I agree. I I think I um, have the same also belief. Um, we probably also need to engage everybody, so they all sit together and they're all part of the same system. Um, not to be uh, afraid of trying, because if you don't try, you may never get the chance to uh, succeed in the future. Um, and also in terms of policy, 100% agree with you. It takes a bold decision, um, but. It will happen if, if there's determination, if there's will, it's going to happen. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fatma. I don't know, uh, Sultan, do we have enough time for questions or I think this is almost 6.10, so we come to the, to the end of the session. I want to really thank our distinguished speakers here, Daniel Kirk, Dr. Fatma Danuti, uh, for their, um, for their, for their, for their, um, for their being with us here today and, and talking about this important subject. Thanks again to Trends for bringing this important um, um, topic, you know, and, 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 and to, to debate and discuss about it. And thank you, our audience, for, for listening. Thanks. Okay, yeah, so um, thank you so much, everyone. And actually, now we'll have a 15 minute coffee break, then we'll proceed to the second panel, inshallah. Thank you. <laughs> The second panel is titled The Role of Education Technologies in Enhancing Learning, Transformational and Future-Focused Approaches. This panel would be moderated by Dr. Idsam Mazroui, Director of Artificial Intelligence, cross Center Unit Technology Innovation, Innovation Institute. And the panel the panelists will have a total of 35 minutes to present, then an open discussion of 15 minutes. May the moderator and the panelists please proceed to the designated seatings. Please welcome. First of all, thank you for attending the first conference uh, held by Trends uh, Research and Advisory uh, Team. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mohammed Al Ali and the Trends team for uh, hosting and organizing the first conference. And it's really important to discuss uh, how we can envision the future of education with uh, such a breakthrough technologies such as large language model, ChatGPT, and other uh, techniques such as Metaverse, and how we can implement these technology in our education and research system. 
So our panel title will be the role of education technologies uh, in enhancing learning transformational and future focused approaches shared and uh, and moderated by uh, me, Dr. Abtisam al mazrui Director of Artificial Intelligence uh, Cross Center Unit in Technology Innovation Institute. And I would like to uh, welcome our first uh, panelist, Dr. Abdullah. Dr. Abdullah he is the President, Provost and the Professor of Computing, Machine Learning and Analytics in Abu Dhabi School of Management, United Arab Emirates. Welcome uh, to this uh, panel. And also, oh, I would like also to welcome Dr. Alexander, Policy Lead, Digital Government Unit, Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, United Kingdom. So maybe you, you were uh, in the first uh, panel and we heard a lot about um, the, the breaking technology and how it's transforming the educational uh, system, the higher educational uh, system, chat GPT, and what is the influence in our, uh, in, in our student in their daily uh, routine and uh, assignments and the projects. And I will take this opportunity um, not to talk about ChatGPT because people maybe you already use ChatGPT, and but to understand why ChatGPT is now here, I think uh, we are late in this discussion because ChatGPT is already here, and it's already disrupting the education, the curriculum. Our students, yeah, since it has been released, it has already been used for their projects, their assignments. It transformed dramatically the way how uh, the professors in the university, they can assist the student because they don't know these essays or senior design project has been created by ChatGPT or not. So personally, for example, from my experience last uh, year since ChatGPT has been released, one of my colleagues, uh, he received a call uh, from his ex-student and she said, I used uh, ChatGPT to create a senior design project. Is it ethical or not? Of course, he answered, no, you are not allowed to do such thing. But how we can ensure using these technology without ChatGPT metaverse in improving the curriculum uh, learning, how it will affect the society uh, impact, the educational system, the research, because nowadays if you use ChatGPT or these large language model, you can prompt, prompt and ask, uh, ask it to do, for example, what do you advise me about the future of education? And I already did this. And it's create for me a lot and an article. Of course, it's not long, three paragraphs about what is the future of the education and how ChatGPT it will affect. So we 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 need we don't need researcher anymore. Do we need, uh, for example, a uh, moderator to moderate this uh, research? Or we can use this res researcher, uh, professors, to enhance the critical uh, thinking, the learning uh, system, the innovation. So we can implement this technology in the education. That's really great. But then what is left for our student, for the researcher, is how we can, or even the coder, how we can use these skills and this technology to improve the service that we are providing, if it's like industrial companies, or even uh, provide a better education that it will uh, focus on the innovation, critical thinking, using the hand scale. So without further ado, I will uh, let Dr. Abdullah first uh, start with his uh, subject, and he will discuss about how these technology, the uh, artificial intelligence, is affecting the educational system and the research. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me to be with you tonight. And uh, <clears throat> so I promise you, I'm not going to talk about Chat GPT right now, okay? Because it's the elephant in the room. Everybody is taking the world by storm. But uh, you know, obviously, Chat GPT is a you know uh, is a language model, and it's based uh, on uh, neural nets and uh, you know, transformers, you know, and it's an AI, you know, platform, uh, and it's almost uh, what we call um, artificial general intelligence, okay? But what I wanted to do is I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, expand uh, the scope a little bit and talk about uh, AI in education in general. And there are some really very uh, nice technologies that have, uh, impacted uh, the learning, uh, teaching and learning, uh, you know, for many, many years, actually. So ChatGPT is the 
new kid, kid on the block, okay? And granted that we have to deal with it, uh, but I'm going to deal with it when I talk about chat GPT from a different perspective. Uh, so if you can just bear with me. So, uh, so as I mentioned, AI uh, has impacted uh, education for the past uh, few years in a very profound way, you know, for the better, we think is for the better, for the best. Uh, investment in uh, AI in education uh, is uh, increasing, uh, you know, worldwide. Uh, obviously, as you know, when investors uh, pump in money, that means they can see that there is uh, value uh, for this particular, uh, you know, platform or technology. And we're also seeing uh, that uh, that uh, the impact on the student learning and teaching and uh, in uh, supporting uh, the critical thinking and uh, adaptability and uh, job readiness and so on of the students. So I'll give you some uh, some some examples uh, of these uh, of these technologies. Okay, so sorry, I have to flip through this here a little bit to uh, oops because it's a PowerPoint presentation uh, I was planning to present it but then I decided that maybe the best the best way is to uh, just talk uh, chat about it so the first uh, the first uh, example of these uh, AI in education is chatbots and digital assistants okay and a chatbot uh, include uh, include uh, chatbots include the ability to understand speech, you know, natural language uh, processing, and use machine learning models to match the intention of the question to answer specific uh, to answer them and recommend specific uh, specific uh, action. Uh, the second example is adaptive learning. And specific type. This is a specific time of AI system that change the pace and tailor the pace uh, of the learner and the order level level of learning based on some you know algorithm and some learning objective and how the uh, user or the student respond to the different uh, the different material that's presented by the by the algorithm. And then the, the, the third example is the AI assisted marketing, uh, marking and, uh, sorry, marking and feedback. Okay. And that is when the uh, AI uh, system can actually look at exams, look at projects, look at quizzes, and then go through it and then mark it and give some valuable feedback to the, to the, to the learner. Some examples of, the, uh, of these in terms of the chatbots, uh, we have a, uh, an example of that is successfully being deployed at Bolton uh, College. Uh, uh, they develop a system called ADA, and uh, uh, the chatbot uh, uh, answers the questions uh, the students, uh, you know, post, and uh, including what their grade is, what their uh, program of study is, prerequisite for courses. Uh, acceptance, uh, you know, how I, I get accepted, what are the requirements, and so on and so forth. And uh, they have used it and effectively, and it has uh, helped the students understand uh, what uh, uh, what requirements they have to meet, and uh, you know, uh, uh, introduce a lot of efficiency, a lot of engagement. And I think one of the speakers mentioned that uh, students. You know, uh, now they they want to feel connected. Okay, they they go to the institution that they matches their values. Okay, and they want to they they want that personalized experience. And with these chatbots, uh, Ada, it gave them that uh, that feeling of intimacy and that feeling of care, and it uh, actually helped in the retention uh, of the students and enhanced the user the student experience. Uh, we also have, in terms of adaptive learning by McCrow Hill uh, Publishing, they have Alex, uh, A-L-E-K-S, okay? This is a, a platform that uh, uses uh, adaptive learning based on 
certain criteria and, and uh, in science, uh, uh, mainly in science, really, like college algebra and math and calculus and, and uh, some business, a little bit of business, some uh, social sciences, other social sciences. And uh, uh, basically, it uh, uses cognitive uh, 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 you know, models that were developed by uh, very uh, talented uh, uh, people to uh, decide on the path of learning and the pace and, uh, uh, and take the students through uh, all the different topics and ensure that comprehension is actually uh, the student comprehends the material before they move to the next model. Uh, next uh, level. Um, in terms of AI-assisted AI as, uh, marking and feedback, uh, we have uh, an example it's called GradeScope. is a is an AI grading uh, application developed at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, and now owned by Turnitin. None other but Turnitin. Turnitin, as you know, is the anti-plagiarism uh, software. Uh, and uh, uh, it can reduce marking time by as much as 75%, which is, you know, for a large university, uh, because, you know, as a professor, the biggest task we have is marking. <laughs> okay. It's not an easy thing to do. Okay. Uh, so these are examples of uh, uh, successful examples of the use of AI uh, in uh, in education. In terms of uh, uh, things that are uh, on the horizon, uh, uh, dialogue-based tutors. These dialogue-based tutors uh, combine the concepts of uh, adaptive learning and uh, chatbots uh, with the aim of helping students learn through conversation rather through like prompts, okay? And they, uh, 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 you know, uh, provide the answer uh, in, a, in a very seamless, uh, seamless fashion. The example of this is uh, Watson, the Watson by IBM, Watson Tutor, okay, is an intelligent tutoring system designed to improve student outcomes and uh, engagement with learning uh, and content expertise from Pearson Education. Of course, Pearson Education, you know, about, they have tremendous amount of uh, uh, content. Uh, the second uh, second example is, uh, or the second use case is the collaborative learning with AI, uh, and that is AI could be used to support collaborative learning, uh, uh, you know, between groups and people. Because again, if you worked in groups, sometimes it's uh, kind of difficult uh, to uh, synchronize things and to uh, communicate effectively, and then uh, the discipline of the different group members and whatnot. So AI can be uh, used to uh, mediate and to manage the uh, process. The uh, the other example of the use case is AI assisted content creation. Okay, and that's now we're getting closer to the elephant in the room. Okay, Chat GPT. Okay, and this is AI-driven tools that create questions uh, from existing uh, uh, existing contents. Okay, and uh, uh, so so as a professor, then I can give the content, and then the application then can generate questions. Okay, can generate questions, and of course, to satisfy our friends from the ministry, we would have to use Bloom's taxonomy and. Uh, uh, the 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 uh, uh, what is it the uh, the Emirates uh, um, you know qualification framework and uh, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, examples of these technologies are Quizbot Twenty One. Uh, Microsoft also uses a similar thing, but they use it with the uh, news uh, summary. A news summary. They take the news. Uh, the news sources, and then they can actually extrapolate from the news, uh, you know, like a digest of uh, of uh, headlines and so on. It's a simil similar similar uh, technology. And then also uh, we have another example of a technology called Wildfire, uh, which is used mainly in the corporate training uh, arena uh, for content creation, uh, for content creation for training courses. Okay.
And then now, da da, Chat GPT. <laughs> so instead of uh, uh, repeating what uh, what uh, my colleagues before uh, have mentioned, then I will just uh, approach it from uh, a different, uh, a little bit from a different perspective, with the exception of should we embrace or should we resist? Okay. So, um, uh, uh, number one is chat GPT is like what we call almost a, uh, a, uh, artificial general intelligence. General intelligence, uh, means that it will pass the Turing test. And that means that it would behave like a human. Okay. And it's, uh, uh like a, an intelligent to human. Okay. So chat GPT or, uh, AG, uh, AG, AGI compete for our intelligence. Okay, so it's going to uh, 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 write articles so that you don't need a copywriter. You don't. You don't read a reporter. Uh, I tried it. Uh, uh, you know, with many things, but one of the things I tried it with is I asked it to write a program for me. Okay, and then I ran it, and it worked. It actually worked. Uh, it's a, it's amazing. So does that mean that we don't need programmers? Okay. In the future, it's going to be a challenge. So it is competing for the higher order of professionals. Whereas before with mechanization and uh, the industrial revolution, it competed with labor, with, with uh, muscles. Now uh, uh, AI, uh, AI is going to be competing with our uh, human intelligence, okay? So that means that we have to redefine what our, what we're going to be doing. What is it that we have to do? Because uh, as you know, this technology is in its infancy. So 50 years from now, 100 years from now, it's going to be very, very advanced. Just like you look at the how the internet was when it was uh, fin uh, first uh, um introduced i mean i remember i was in graduate school okay <laughs> sorry <laughs> but it was like you know we only use them in the computer science departments now you know we use emails and stuff nobody knew about it okay so so the question is uh which uh, i think one of the uh, previous speakers um, uh, asked is that should we embrace or should we resist is it a threat or is it an opportunity okay and uh uh, you know, I think it's prudent to embrace. I think it's imp uh, prudent to embrace because technology, you can't really resist technology. I mean, so many people, and we, you know, probably you're old enough to know that uh, many, uh, many, uh, at, when the, uh, when the, these um, new, like email, I remember when email was not allowed. <laughs> Companies said, no, don't use emails. This is like bad. Bad, 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 bad. Don't use. I remember, and uh, I remember when uh, I was in uh, high school, and we were not allowed to have to use a calculator, because it was thought that it would corrupt your mind. You need to memorize the the multiplication table, and you need to be able to do the, you know ar arithmetics and look up the uh, you know sine and cosine values and in the back of the book and you know all this kind of stuff i mean i mean the teachers they they felt you know what is this this is like not allowed but now we 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 use it for granted because we embraced it and now uh, you know uh, if we want to multiply uh, you know two numbers you know in fact, sometimes, you know, even like single digits when we use the calculator, you know. I mean, we became lazy, but we we relied on the calculator to do much, much bigger things. And if you want to do even more things, then you use the spreadsheet, okay? Because you can do a lot of stuff with the spreadsheet, especially if you're, uh, if you're uh, uh, you know, expert, you become an expert or, you know, a good, good user of the spreadsheet. So... So definitely do not, I believe, you know, that's why I advocate. We should not fight it. We should embrace it. How? That's something that's debatable. You know, we need to talk about this. At, uh, at my school, uh, we've already allowed the students to use it, but, you know, we set 
some of the professors say, did you use ChatGPT? Come true. Okay, tell me the truth because I can find out. Actually, there are some software that can determine. There is some sort of watermark I, I read that that uh, the, the, the platform would, uh, would leave uh, in there and then some people, clever people, are uh, developing applications to discover that uh, watermark, okay? So, uh, so we're sitting, uh, we decided that we, we're gonna sit with the students and do an interview. Okay, here's your, uh, this is your uh, assessment because it's, uh, it's a research. Uh, we give, we're graduate school, so we give a research uh, uh, assignment. We sit with them and then we say, okay, explain to me. Okay, what's the objective? What's this, the finding, why this, that? And, you know, it's a very lengthy process, but at least right now we're, until we figure out exactly what we're gonna do, uh, uh, um, you know, this is a stop, uh, stop uh, gap m measure. Some people, huh? Time up here. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, so, huh? Okay, just give me one moment. Okay, sorry. This is the chat GPT. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, anyway, uh, so, uh, I, okay. Some of the some of the uh, other things that I really wanted to s to say is uh, I'm not going to talk about the legal and stuff because uh, I think this maybe uh, different people have uh, um, maybe different opinion and so on. But uh, I, I do want to talk about two things, and that's AI bias because we know now we can document that AI is bias. Okay. And I, uh, I give you two examples. One is uh, Amazon uh, tried to hire an HR director and they gave the data, their data, to the machine learning uh, model. And guess what? Did not choose a single woman. Only men made it to the finalists. And then uh, the leadership said, mm, how come there are no women? So he asked... Uh, uh, the programmers to go and find out what the data is, uh, what the data is, and they said, mm, because we gave it our data and we have no woman. So that's bias. That's number one. Number two is, uh, I want to invite you to, uh, to uh, look for Ask Delphi. Ask Delphi is a project by the um, Allen Institute, uh, AI Institute, and uh, they uh, formed an experiment in which they found that uh, uh, they, they took all the data from the popular culture, you know, and uh, uh, they found that uh, the AI is pre prejudiced against women, against minorities, against people of determination, uh, and they documented all of that, okay? So that's one I wanted to mention to you. So the, the second, the second problem is uh, is the alignment problem, and that is uh, when the designer, the designer, uh, you know, designs the system, uh, the AI system uh, with certain objective, you know, uh, okay, with certain outcome, certain objective, behave. Hopefully, you'll behave this way, but in reality, uh, the AI system may behave completely different. So how how to you know, how to address that, especially if that completely different is an ethical, immoral, you know, so on and so forth. Okay, that's it. So I will stop now and uh, perhaps some people they can ask some questions. Thank you. Thank you. So for, I would like to go directly to uh, Dr. Alexander because of uh, we are limited with the time, then we'll end up with the Q&A open for the, for the audience and also with the, with the moderator, with the panelist. Thank you very much. I hope you can actually hear me. It's always a, a, yes, a, a it's fun, fun example of doing this, uh, you know, talking about technology and education and then making sure that the technology works. Um, hi, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm Alexander Yossid. I'm a policy lead in the digital government unit team at the Tony Blair Institute. Just for a bit of background, we're a nonprofit that works across strategy, policy and delivery to help political leaders create transformational change for their citizens. Uh, so the topic of this panel is, I think, very 
relevant to what we do. Um, and we have policy teams, we have advisory teams, uh, we also have our own team that actually delivers um, a form of educational offer called Generation Global. So my contribution today is informed by a blend of this practical experience as well as policy research into best practice. And my work at the Institute focuses on how public services, including education, should adapt to and adopt new technology. My previous experience is in venture capital investment in education technology and in digital strategies for the higher education sector. So in that time, I have seen many, many ways in which that can be transformational from fairly simple things like reduced costs and saving teachers, uh, lecturers, administrators time, um, effective assessment that goes beyond exams where we just you know put learners in a room with pen and paper, lock them in for three hours and uh, hope something comes out of that. Um, on to the much more exciting in some ways, um, advances we've just discussed around artificial intelligence, around preparation for um, a world of new skills. And um, my esteemed co-panelists have now discussed some of these examples. I'd like to bring to the discussion initially, and then I'm sure in the questions we'll cover this in a lot more detail, an additional policy angle. So here is my provocation, if you will, to the panel and to the audience. For transformational tech to be truly transformational, we need to make sure that it is adopted and used outside of just small pockets of good practice. So I'd like to be in a world where instead of being able to you know, list five examples of good use of AI in education, we just take it for granted because this is what every school, every university, every educational setting does. So how can we, if we want to embrace these new technologies rather than reject them, how can we do it everywhere? Because the truth is, and it's really refreshing to talk to an audience where I don't have to go through a long list of facts to prove this. The education crisis is real, it is global, and it is urgent. And the education crisis is driven by the tension between ultimately three policy goals that need to be combined and that we're struggling to combine. Providing high quality education at national scale and at sustainable cost. And so in the world, you know, we have issues with quality, with levels of learning poverty actually growing since COVID. We have issues with cost, with two thirds of countries spending less than um, sort of the five to seven thousand dollars per student that has been shown to be the optimal level for educational outcomes. But also even in countries like England, you know, today we have teachers striking for higher pay and for better conditions. And we're also facing an enormous challenge of scale. Our analysis of the Institute shows that we're going, there are an additional 272 million children a year who will need to be in school by 2030 for us to meet the UN's Sustainable Development Goal 4 of a secondary education for every child. That is 110 million more than we are currently on track to provide school places for. So there really needs to be new models. There needs to be a genuine transformation. And we believe technology can help resolve this dilemma of quality, scale, and cost. And let me give you just one example, some of the thinking we've done on this. Um, so last summer, we proposed a new model for the delivery of foundational learning that is free at the point of access, that is focused on minimum proficiency in literacy, numeracy, and digital skills, and that is adapted for all learners and for different channels. We called it at the time a world education service. So our proposal, our calculation was that it is possible to create a global team of about 15 to 20 people, experts in learning, experts in technology and experts in partnership that would create sequenced curriculum maps for minimum proficiency in literacy, numeracy, and digital skills. So a ladder, if you will, of skills going from, I'm just starting to learn this to, I know what we expect a 10 year old uh, person to know what we're expecting a 15 year old to know. And then the partnerships teams could go out to work with providers in the public sector, in the private sector, and in the nonprofit sector to create content aligned to those same curriculum maps 
but adapted to different channels of delivery. So you could imagine working with a social media company to create content that is the right fit for that social media platform type of content, whether that's you know, really short uh, pieces of text and image uh, as on Twitter or engaging videos or whatever else you might have. They might work with telecom, telecom providers to create a SMS-based version of the same curriculum but with content adapted to the platform. And they could work with public schools to deliver that content in schools. If we combine this with the sorts of advances we just talked about, like adaptive learning, like formative assessments, so assessment throughout a learner's time on the platform, and with a portable learner record, which would allow learners to shift between platforms, they could start with a text message-based uh, lesson and then go to school, pick up where they left off, them themselves personally, answer a quiz, help the system understand what it is that they have maybe missed in their learning and go back um, to the text-based learning for when they're back at home. This way we could create a sort of all-encompassing structure for learning that combines online, offline and low-tech channels. And our calculations suggested that in order to launch a, an initiative such as this, the initial startup cost would be less than half a percent of the annual venture capital investment in education technologies. So it is possible there are the technical means to use technology to genuinely transform learning at all levels, whether we're talking about foundational skills, whether we're talking about higher education, whether we're talking about vocational education. What is missing is the conditions within the system and the collaboration between the edtech sector and the public sector in particular to be able to achieve these things. So tech has introduced this combination of scale, quality, and sustainable cost in other areas of life, particularly in the private sector, but it hasn't yet done in education. Why is that? Well, so my experience suggests that when we talk about edtech, particularly when we talk about private sector initiatives, it's either seen as a business to consumer product sort of a form of or as a form of enterprise software, which is sold to individual schools or school districts. And when we talk about the B2C ed tech products, online courses, smartphone learning apps that go out straight to the learner, they do largely depend on learners' intrinsic motivation and they require additional resources to engage with money and time for the learners which unfortunately quite often does lead to worsening of inequality and kind of creates almost a shadow education system. When we talk about B2B products, enterprise software, the way that the market works is that combining scale and impact becomes really difficult. So enterprise software scales at the end of the day by optimizing for high volume sales, not necessarily educational impact. Whereas when we talk about innovative startups, which do want to optimize for impact, their survival depends on being able to get early traction. And so for them, the target is expert users, teachers who are already really interested in these things, who are already clued up into innovations such as chat GPT. And so this makes it really difficult for them to bridge the, the adoption gap, if you will, from the expert users, from the 10, 15% of teachers who might be using really advanced techniques in the classroom to the average teacher and to the mass of learners. I think what we kind of tend to forget when we have these conversations is that edtech is not a B2B product and it's not a consumer product. In order to achieve scale, we need to see it as a GovTech product. And so to achieve impact at scale, what we need is to align incentives between educators on the, and government on the one hand and providers of software and investors on the other. So for the former for government and for educators, what really matters is the impact of a product on the learner, whether that is gains to learning or improving the environment in the classroom or ensuring that the admin processes run as smoothly as possible. So for governments, there's an additional aspect of scale here where they do want to see that impact um, at a national scale. But when we talk about startup entrepreneurs, when we talk about investors, their main priority is scaling to the national, ideally global market. And that is the key to their long-term survival and success. So what we need to do is to create a system where 
the conditions exist for national scale and impact to be combined. And this is something that we call tech inclusive education policy. And we do believe that this is ultimately the role of governments to create those conditions. So when we have these debates over red tech, you know, we, we, we have typically these two approaches. We talk about tech driven um, education, where we see technology as the solution to all the problems that might exist. Um, we can talk about you know, VR, which can solve everything. Um, or even AI that can solve everything. And unfortunately, I think we now know that this doesn't really work because it ignores the complexities of the context within which education happens. So it's kind of almost putting the cart before the horse. On the other hand, we have um, sort of this, what we call tech-assisted approaches to education, where we take existing technology and we take existing pedagogical approaches and we look at ways for tech to improve things a little bit. Bit. It's transformational. It can save time, it can save money. But at the end of the day, it's subject to the very same constraints of scale that exist in existing systems and uh, that therefore are behind the tech education, uh, the education crisis. So, what we would advocate for is tech inclusive education policy. It's one that understands deeply the context within which policy education needs to be delivered and the purpose to which it is directed. So the changing needs of learners, the changing needs of economies that um, education needs to address. And com combines this understanding to create new practices, which include technology as one of the ways to deliver this. Because at the moment, oft all too often, we see technology as something we sort of sprinkle on top of education and hope it takes root and hope it improves things. But we really need to think much more deeply about how do we embed education with it, embed technology within education systems? So that means creating conditions where tech can be used well across the whole system, not just in pockets of good practice. And then providers will have the large markets they need to sustain their businesses and to continue developing these innovative new approaches. And governments will see returns on their investment in tech in terms of educational outcomes. And what we found is that this covers much more than just infrastructure or connectivity, which is what people usually talk about, because these conditions for effective use of technology, they include things like teacher training, they include things like the integration of tech in the curriculum, they include things like deeper thinking about the opportunities and the threats of new technologies like ChatGPT, and ensuring that the system is nimble and agile and can actually adapt to those changes. So when tech is used well across the whole system, we believe then it will genuinely become transformational education. And in order to achieve this, we believe it is the job of policymakers to create what we call minimum viable conditions. I mean, think this, this will be my kind of last point to make before we dive into the discussion. So when startup founders build products, they usually deal with situations where there is a lot of uncertainty and where they have limited resources, but they're trying to build complex systems. What is believed to be best practice is to build minimum viable pro uh, products, which rather than investing the whole of the limited resource available into one aspect of the product, for example, into building more and more functionality, tries to distribute that resource more equally between the, all the things that matter for a product to work well. And that is both functionality, but also reliability, usability, emotional design. And so, in the same vein, when we think about education reform, when we think about how can we prepare education systems to become useful ground for the use of technology, rather than do what unfortunately has been done all too often, where the limited amount of resources that a government has are invested into productivity and into distributing devices to every child without giving thought to the other aspects of the education system that really matter, things like system administration, things like uh, teacher training and recruitment and retention, things like the curriculum and the focus um, on particular skills for learners. All of those things can be addressed to perhaps a slightly less ambitious extent. So maybe we don't have one-to-one -one devices. Maybe we have one device for every five students. But we ensure that teachers are trained to work with students who are sharing a device. And we ensure that the curriculum is adopted to ensure that learning happens effectively and that the skills that the system wants to create among its um, learners 
are ones that can be developed in this way and that create the conditions for future development. And so I would encourage everyone in the audience, whether policymakers, whether uh, you know, startup um, founders or providers of technology, investors, educators themselves to consider what those minimum viable conditions might be for their particular context and to align the strategies for developing different aspects of the education system, to collaborate on creating the conditions where tech is used effectively to resolve this education crisis trilemma and to deliver a high quality education at national scale and at sustainable cost. Uh, thank you, and I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you, uh, Dr. Alexander, and thank you for keeping up on the uh, time. So there is a lot of question if you want to uh, envision the future with uh, these technological uh, tool and I, I'm gonna question uh, also the panelists with the key thing because I don't want to end this session with uh, open-ended uh, question. We should at least to provide uh, the, the audience with some of the um, guidance so they can build their uh, uh, studies in, in, uh, and the, their, the, the, the vision for how the education it will uh, be in the near future within a couple of years. So um, the utilization of such technological uh, tool, uh, whether it's built based on large language models such as uh, ChatGPT uh, or uh, such as advanced, uh, for example, adaptive uh, generative uh, AI uh, model, chat AI assistant model, tailored uh, AI uh, technique based on the student uh, feedback, how we can use these technological uh, model as well in the grading uh, system. Maybe you mentioned one important uh, point, uh, Dr. Abdullah, about um, Currently, uh, we are using the, this AI to grade the exams, but I think in the future, even we, we can use this model as well to change the grading uh, system based on each individual student. So why uh, I am assisting the student and I'm giving the same uh, curriculum for each one? As a human, we have different thinking, we have different thought, and also the way how we perceive the information, it's totally different. And during one year or 18 years of, uh, of our life, we are receiving the same type of information or year and uh, after a year after a, after a year. But the, the beauty of, I think, how we can use uh, AI, uh, 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 AI techniques, whether it's based on large language model, we can adapt this technique and tailor this uh, outcome based on each uh, uh, person's talents and skills and what is his interest. Because the futures and the career that it will uh, be in, envisioned after 18 years. So once he is in the KG kindergarten, we are teaching him something. But when after 18 years from his graduation, it's totally different. The market is different because the technology there has totally been uh, changed. As Dr. Abdullah mentioned, when he was, he was not allowed to use emails. And now also we are uh, forbidding some of the student, uh, some of the student like one of the university, they ban their student to use chat GBT. And uh, chat GBT, for example, uh, also passed the MBA, MBA exam. So do we need, for example, in the future lawyers? Do we need coders? Currently, we are teaching them uh, how to code, how to be lawyer, how to be engineers. But I think the way how they they should be uh, uh, teached or uh, and during their curriculum, it is, should be tailored based on their interest, what they want to develop in the future, and it should be adaptable. One of the key things that we, we should also mention uh, today, and I would like also to ask Dr. Alexander and Dr. Abdullah, that the, um, the adaptability of this technology, it, it is not fair because some uh, countries nowadays, they have access to this tool. Others, they are forbidden, for example, and uh, I will not mention the countries, but each, for example, ChatGPT is not accessed based on where, where you are located and based on the country. So I think also in a global scale, we'll have a gap in the education. We'll have gap in the skills. We have more advanced people uh, who are based on using the tailored educational technological system in their education and whether it is uh, in, in high school or whether it is in a uh, research uh, field, there will be certainly a gap. So how we can govern this gap?
what is the policy? I would like Dr. Alexander, maybe he can elaborate more. What do you think, how is the future for this educational uh, assistant AI uh, tool that will be implemented and how we can ensure that the same educational level, level will be also implemented in, uh, in a global scale? Thank you. And yes, absolutely, there is a danger of these technologies increasing inequality rather than addressing inequality. And it all comes down to whether we're, we're able to create the systems that the systems, the education systems, not just the tech systems that make effective use of this tech. I think, you know, to your question on what, what could we do to, to prevent this, I think there is definitely room for more global cooperation on these issues. So we had in September uh, the UN Transforming Education Summit, which made some progress around questions of what can countries around the world do to make better use of technology? What are some of the coordination efforts that can happen um, when it comes to the various platforms that exist, national platforms as well as um, private sector platforms? And something that we'd like to see more of is a discussion of, is there a role for international organizations or international agencies to ensure that there is almost a common standard for the use of these technologies, where we understand now that foundational learning, you know, we call it foundational for a reason, it opens up the opportunities for people to learn the necessary skills to then make use of chat GPT, to then make use of various um, other advanced technologies. And we know that adaptive learning is actually a very good way of building up foundational skills for learners who start at different points. Um, there was actually just a paper that came out a couple of days ago that showed that students progress when they are given the opportunity to practice particular skills, progress at very, very similar rates. So the key point of difference, it would appear, for at least some subjects, students isn't necessarily talent, but rather what is their starting point? And if we can make sure that everyone gets up to the same levels across different contexts by using a blend of offline, online, and low-tech approaches, then we can create a situation where pretty much every learner in the world will be starting from a similar position. And so it will be much easier for them to keep up with these advances. And there are, I think, you know, you've referred to some governments that may be potentially less receptive to some of these technologies. This is where um, you know, ChatGPT is available for users in many countries at the moment. And then the question is, can we ensure that education systems understand how to integrate it into their learning process rather than see it as a threat? And um, I do really like the example of calculators, right? Calculators used to be um, essentially banned from, from classrooms. And, uh, you know, we were told, you're never going to carry a calculator around with you all day, but now we all do with our phones. So um, there's definitely room for these more agile. Thank you. Um, so here, here is another question also to Dr. Uh, Abdullah. What, what is your thought about how, what is the policy and the governance from educational point of view in the higher in the higher university? For example, they should implement to ensure that when the graduates they go from the school, they are they can use the skill and the, the knowledge that has been taught uh, to, to them throughout all the years. Well, I didn't. I didn't get to mention uh, the uh, the challenge with uh, the Chat GPT. I, I hate uh, because it's taken over the conversation. But obviously, it's uh, a large language models because uh, you know Google. They have their own uh, a platform which they're going to announce very soon. Uh, but. It's the uh, if you st if you stop using these large uh, language models uh, in schools because you're afraid of them because you don't know how to deal with them because you don't have a policy. Uh, <clears throat> so the best thing is just to shut it off, just like what happened with calculators before. Okay, the problem is in the marketplace, people are using it. So you're gonna you're gonna have graduates who are going to come out of the universities 
who don't know how to use this technology effectively, you know, they may be using it, you know, personally, you know, for other stuff, but then they go to the marketplace and then they find that these companies, they expect you as a graduate to know how to use it. So now you have this misalignment. And as you know, universities always strive to prepare people for the marketplace because after all, this is what governments, you know, they fund the universities because they want them to do, to, to prepare people to be productive citizens and, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to work and, uh, you know, become an active member of society. So, so that's, uh, that's really a problem. Now, I feel that, and again, I don't have the answer, okay, because it's, we're still reacting to this, but I feel that we need to embrace and instead of giving my assignment or my assessments or my projects outside of chat, uh, these language models, uh, uh, then try to sort of like align them together and deal with the, you know, the use of these tools and whatnot. Why not redesign the assignment and the assessments around those language models? So deliberately then say, go and use the language model to do one, two, three, four, and then come back and uh, interact with it in this way and what not find out what critically evaluate what what the answer is find a flaw defend it uh, uh, give it another prompt compare this that all of a sudden now you've 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 uh, you've leveraged the, these platforms to uh, promote critical thinking and analysis and and uh, you know presentation and so on, and in doing so, then you are preparing this uh, this uh, this student or this graduate not only fulfilling the 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 objective of you know as in academia we talk about rigor and theory and this and that and whatnot, uh, but also the marketplace as well. Thank you. Thank you. So. Um... Also, I would like to open up uh, the eye for, for the audience uh, to one important thing. So we embrace this technology, but what will happen is we will be totally independent or dependent on, on, on AI. So uh, maybe a long time ago when we don't have a smartphone, we memorize the number of our colleagues, of our parents. But nowadays, I don't know even my phone number, my work number. So I, whenever you ask me, I will go and I will check my phone phone number and then I will give it to the people. So what will happen when we become dependent on these uh, AI tool, we will lose some certain way how we can write an essay, how we can cre be creative. But the, the most important is, I think, uh, um, and maybe Alexander and Dr. Abdullah, they can comment, we set the fundamental, the fundamental that we would like our people as a citizens, as citizens our children, to uh, to take away in, in their life what it will be, uh, to, it will help them to go uh, throughout their life journey. Be, what are the skills that they need? So I don't think it will be like more. Uh, depends on the faculty uh, certificate that you have, whether it's engineering, uh, medicine, or it will be skills oriented. What skill you have, not even the coding, but I think also the, the, the thing, how, how we do the basic life skills. And I think Dr. Uh, also uh, Saeed, he mentioned very important thing. So everything that it will elevate your mind, it will elevate your heart, it will, you can use also your hands to, to work. These are the most uh, fundamental skills that we can build on uh, our uh, education. And we have also to mention that these uh, large language model, whether it is used as a chatbot or as an AI assistant, or even uh, embedded with a uh, visionary, for example, experiment, you can use it in a lab, or you can, for example, while you are explaining in the lecture uh, how the how you can do a surgery for uh, the, the medical uh, engineering school, you can envision the whole process using these uh, vision large language uh, 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 models, but these are biased based on the fact uh, that the data that has been uh, trained uh, on. And there is also a cost. So currently there is a million of dollars per day to run these, uh, these uh, uh, models. It will be certainly monetized. 
So how we can get the benefit uh, out, out of these uh, uh, models? At the same time, we have to consider also everyone should, uh, should have the creative thinking even if we depend on the AI, but I think the most important how to utilize this technology to improve uh, our life, our skill, our education, and our research. And the most important thing is uh, it will be benefit for us as a human being. So the final uh, remark from Dr. Alexander and Dr. also Abdullah, if you would like to add anything. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, no, I mean, you know, what you mentioned is uh, absolutely correct. Uh, these... Uh, uh, technologies, uh, particularly the language models or the uh, artificial general intelligence, when we come closer to it, are going to challenge, uh, uh, you know, us as humans. I mean, what are we going to do when when you don't have uh, uh, a writer or when you have the newscasters being a robot, uh, when you have uh, a lawyer who can be a uh, uh, can be uh, an AI uh, agent, uh, even a doctor, some certain certain uh, in, in medicine uh, that can be done uh, by these uh, systems. Then, you know, question is, what do we do? Okay, and there are a lot of things that we can do. Okay, because uh, uh, you know uh, we. Uh, we are human beings, we interact with each other socially, we uh, uh, can create wealth, we can establish businesses, we can uh, govern, uh, we can uh, create policies that make sense, we can uh, fight poverty, we can uh, 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 you know, ensure e equality and uh, justice and so on. So these, so we will, uh, I believe that we will go, we will become more human, okay? Uh, we become more human and the mundane things that uh, that waste a lot of our time. I used to be, I actually used to program and I used to spend hours and hours and hours and hours programming, okay? Uh, if, a, if a robot can do it, then why not? Let me enjoy life. So uh, I, I, do, you know, I, I tend to be an optimist Okay, but definitely we need to approach our uh, educational system in a different way, uh, uh, and we need to, um, you know, find, um, uh, you know, determine how we're going to deal with these uh, disruptive technologies. Thank you. And one one last question uh, to Alexander. So just to mention that we we maybe embrace ChatGPT, but ChatGPT has misinformation. So not all that these technology, they are biased and they have also toxic. And now the debate, how we can remove the toxicity of these uh, models, how we can remove these biased uh, large language model, how we can ensure that we have a policy for this. So maybe Dr. Alexander, what is your thought about this? Thank you. I think when it comes to the large language models, let's not, let's not name names uh, and avoid the particular brand in this case, um, they are not optimizing for truth. They're not optimizing for accuracy, right? They're, they're optimizing for a plausible statement. And so for us, this may be an opportunity, not just in terms of policy making, I much more so I think in terms of education to help learners identify when a statement may sound correct, but requires fact checking. So this is one of the things where we actually have an opportunity to build on the education system that we have with these tools because we can see that just because something sounds true doesn't necessarily mean it's true. And I, I absolutely agree that it's an opportunity to save time on, on, on the mundane things. At the moment, these models can produce texts that are, that, that are fine, right? They are, they are surprisingly good for a machine. They are fine for a person to produce, but they do not approach great writing. They do not approach great creative inventive policy. And if these models can pass MBA exams, maybe that tells us more about the MBA exams and the MBA programs than, than it does about the model. So I too am optimistic. 
And also it should, it should be mentioned that these models are built based on reinforcement learning human feedback. So currently maybe you think they are intelligent, but if they receive a human feedback, they can be the, the they can give you unfalse information because they are receiving a lot of information from a human feedback which is incorrect. So maybe now it is clever, but later on it will be uh, it will be not. I think we have a question from the audience. Yes, uh, uh, my question was uh, more into is uh, AI reliable, but I think you kind of answered that. But the second question I have, will AI be able to shape our young people's mind? So we notice how social media and social uh, activities kind of set a new standards to our daily lives. But in the future, would AI be able to dedicate what, what are we thinking or shape our young uh, future's uh, mind? And specifically to the point that it's not reliable when it comes to the data. A question I would like to hear your thoughts, Dr. Abdullah, first, please. Uh, very, yeah. very interesting, interesting question. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, the system is uh, first of all the these language models are frozen in time. Okay, so all the data is is from twenty twenty one, I believe, or twenty twenty one. So all the information that the this this uh, this chat chat gpt has is from 2021 that's number one okay but when it when it becomes live when it becomes dynamic and continuous learning so to speak uh, that that's going to be the next phase okay then yes it it, w it would affect the uh, the uh, the children uh, um, you know, and we need to have parental guidance, so to speak, and, and maybe some sort of label about <laughs> the different the different platform or the different prompts or something like that. Uh, the problem is that, uh, and and um, a lot of people have uh, considered that is the um, I mentioned it is the alignment problem, because these uh, systems are learning from the data. Uh, you don't guarantee the result. You, 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 they may not listen to you, okay? The, the system may not listen to you. It may not behave in the way you intended it to behave. It may behave in its own way. In fact, some people, uh, you know, they, they, you know, they speculate, would they become conscious? Would they become like us humans and start having a free will and, you know, uh, uh, things like that. I mean, it's more like, uh, uh, you know, science fiction and stuff like that. But, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a legitimate question to ask. So the answer, I feel, yes, it will impact our youngsters and, and, uh, and our children, just like social media did. You know, nobody, nobody envisioned in the beginning that the Internet and, you know, uh, all the different things that exist within it uh, will impact our children, but they did. And, uh, uh, you know, we need to deal with that. Thank you. Just to conclude, thank you, Dr. Alexander, for your uh, time. And I would like to thank also Dr. Abdullah for being us today. I would just uh, um, finalize this uh, panel by a uh, just uh, bring to your attention whatever you are experiencing today, whether it is built. Uh, based on GPT-3, GPT-4 is coming after a few months. And the people who are experienced GPT-4, they say it is, it is beyond, it's beyond the imaginations because GPT-3 is built on, based on 175 billion parameters. People claim that it's, the GPT-4 is built based on 1 trillion parameters. So the, and the amount of the intelligence, it will not even be uh, uh, released. I think there is a certain action that it should be done today. We, enough to stop talking. I think there should be an action towards the educational system, how we can speed up the education system transformation, how we can utilize these uh, models, whether it is based on large language model or chatbot or AI assistant uh, tool to help uh, shaping the future of the education and uh, research. Thank you again for uh, Trends uh, 
research and advisory for uh, holding this the first conference and shed the light on the importance of how we can embed these transformational uh, technology uh, throughout the education and the research. Thank you. Okay. So thank you so much for the second panel. Th thank you very much for the second panel. Just a conclusion, we have to conclude the conference. Um, so I'd, I'd just like to uh, first thank everyone who participated today and the audience. And I'd like to, uh, to, uh, to say sorry for, for what happened of technical issues at the beginning. And thank you for bearing with us. Uh, what an enlightenment, uh, enlightening panels and discussions we've had today. With that, I'd like to conclude today's conference. It was an absolute honor to present this conference. Please note that we will continue this conference tomorrow at 4 p.m. UAE time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.